What is up guys? Welcome to another video. I hope that you guys are all doing good. In this video, we're going to break down Terrence Howard and Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's very interesting. I've been following this story for now, what, at least two weeks. So I'm, I, was, I did not think that Neil deGrasse Tyson was going to respond, if I'm being honest. I thought, I thought he was scared. I thought he was scared to debate, but it seems like Neil deGrasse Tyson is up for it. I recently learned I got name checked by Terrence Howard on his recent appearance on Joe Rogan. I reached out to Neil deGrasse Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He was like, hey man, yeah, I'd love for you to come on my show, do my radio, do my TV thing. would love that. I was like, yeah, but let me, I've got something I want to introduce to you. I got name checked because eight years ago, he sent me a 36 page treatise and it was only 36 pages. Pages, pages, pages. So this is Terrence Howard attempting to reinvent mathematics. Okay, okay. That right there is a slight shot because he's been doing this for, I don't know, his what, whole life. He has gone to university. He's an astrophysicist. So then here comes what Terrence Howard thinking that he can just cut in line and become the greatest scientific mind of all time. It doesn't really work that way. It's very fascinating to see the dynamic between Terrence Howard and Neil deGrasse Tyson. I've been watching a lot of Neil deGrasse Tyson interviews and I've noticed that he has a superiority complex. Just look at the history of everybody doing big projects and it's never driven by exploration. It's never driven by science. It's never driven by curiosity. Not if it's big and expensive. It's driven by the fact that people don't want to die. So there's a war driver. It's also driven by the fact that people want to get wealthy. So it's not only to Terrence Howard, to be fair. It's to everyone. I've seen it during Joe Rogan interviews and other people which have interviewed him as well. But this is very prevalent when it comes to them specifically because I'm starting to notice what there is a teacher-student kind of a relationship where the teacher is somewhat envious of the student because the student has, you know, that young energy, that new way of thinking, and the teacher is corrupted by losing a lot or by trying a lot and failing. That's the exact same thing as if I were to go to a hundred girls and all of those girls turn me down. I mean, the hundred and one girl will be very difficult to talk to and I might lose my self-confidence. But then again, if I'm a psychopath, then it doesn't really matter. Because I find this very interesting, right? If you compare the two, you have what the attractive man, which has a lot of women and kind of like gets to do whatever he wants. And then you have I will not say that he's ugly, but he's not as attractive as Terrence Howard. Uh, he has probably had to study his whole life and he's been doing this ever since he was a child, right? So he's like, you can't really cut in line, buddy. And physics. A little backstory there. I took initial interest in Terrence because my mother mm. said to me, uh, do you know Terrence Howard? I said, yeah, I know, I mean, the actor? She said, yeah. Well, I heard him interviewed on NPR. Mm. On there, he said that, like, when he was a kid, he wanted to be, like, a scientist and mm. study the universe. I said, well, that's cool. Okay, maybe we'll get him on Star Talk. We love talking to celebrities who have a sort of soft geek underbelly. <laughs> At the time, I... <laughs> but you see, the funny part is, like, you are a celebrity. It's a little bit hypocritical, but let's continue. I didn't quite know how to get in touch with him, but... We met at a something called the Upfronts, which is where networks present their next season's TV shows. I saw him at an event um, uh, Upfront. And then this came in, in my inbox. In this particular case, since I basically solicited it from him, I actually spent time reading every line of all 36 pages. And I commented. My comments are in red here. You see that? So I, I spent a lot of time on it. And I thought, out of respect for him, what I should do is give him my most informed critical analysis that I can. Okay. In my field, we call that a peer review. You come up with an idea, you present it either at a conference or you first write it up and you send it to your colleagues. It is their duty to alert you of things about your ideas that are either misguided or wrong or... or yeah, but this is the problem. Science itself is kind of 
clunky right now. We don't really know where we're heading off to. The last time we had, what, a crazy invention, well, that was, what, the iPhone? There is some kind of, like, a limit to science right now. But now we're in the, what, the third dimension, so we can't really, we can't really do more than what our body allows us to. The, mis the calculation that doesn't work out or the, the logic doesn't comport, that's their job. Mm. Not all ideas will sh turn out to be correct. Most won't be. But okay. to get to that point, you need to know things like what has everyone else said about this same t subject? Am I repeating someone else's work? Okay. Is this a new insight that no one else has had, but has foundations that are authentic or legitimate or objectively true? Am I making a false assumption? Am I making an assumption that someone else has already shown to be false? All of this goes on, on the frontier of science. Let me make it clear that I'm delighted when I see people with active minds trying to tackle the great unknowns in the universe. It's a beautiful thing. 100% and this is what the teachers curse because the teacher is always going to sun the student whether the teacher is picking up on it or not the teacher is always going to sun the student I've been with a lot of my teachers right and I've presented certain things and they say it's not possible just because they could not accomplish that right and that's where I'm at where Terence is not I, I will not really say that he's winning this but it's He's always going to be able to push further because he's not the teacher. That people want to participate on this frontier. What can happen is if you're a fan of a subject, let's say, a hobbyist, let's call it, it's possible to know enough about mm. that subject to think you're right, okay. but not enough about that subject to know that you're wrong. Mm. And so there's this sort of valley in there, a valley of false confidence. This has been studied by others, and it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's the phenomenon where a little bit of knowledge, you over-assess how much of that subject you actually know. And then when you learn even more, you realize, no, I didn't know as much as I thought I did. So then there's a sort of a... That is how I was thinking with YouTube, right? But then I was both the teacher and the student, because with YouTube, you have to try a lot of things, right? But then you start to figure out like, whoa, like there's a lot that I do not know about. Then that's when you kind of like go into this dip. And I went what into this dip when I was three years into my YouTube journey. Then I went into the dip and I start to figure out like, whoa, there's, there's certain things that you did correctly, right? But I did not really understand what I was doing. I was just doing. But me being both the teacher and the student, I realize that sometimes I just need to push. Instead of like overthinking and think, oh, what am I going to do today? And is this video going to be perfect? No, sit down, film the video and start editing. Maybe you can edit away some of the mistakes. Maybe you can, you know, perfect certain things, but you have to do. Doing is, I will have to say, what, 70% then of course, you have to analyze yourself and analyze what you're doing correct, and you double down on what you're doing correct. Lull there, and then when you learn even more, you come back up. Ultimately, learning enough to know whether you were right or wrong. To become an expert means you spend all this time. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm. You can't just sit in an armchair. And I usually say, I know enough to know that I know nothing at all. Hey, I'm now an expert. It requires years and years of study, especially looking through journals where new ideas are published and contested. That's what we have learned is the most effective means of establishing that which is objectively true or determining that which is objectively false. Hmm. Both of those work hand in hand to move the needle on our understanding of the universe. But. If the system is corrupt, then you can't really have that ecosystem because I've noticed what, if you take what the pharmaceutical companies, for instance, right, they could be saving so many lives, right? But they think profit instead of actually saving people. I've been watching a lot of comments and a lot of discussions which are happening in the comment section. And one of the things which have really stuck out to me is the fact that a lot of people are discussing that science might be a conspiracy. Now, 
I don't believe that Neil deGrasse Tyson and all of these scientists are a part of this conspiracy. What I believe is happening is, of course, there's always going to be an elite which is controlling the information. They control what we can and what we can look at. Uh, so the people which write the books, right? Those are the people which we maybe should look at and say, maybe they are committing that conspiracy. Maybe they are filtering the information a little bit. So the Neil deGrasse Tyson's and the other scientists go with just one specific path and they can't really think outside of the box because they're taught a certain thing. I'm gonna read you just my opening line here. It's titled one times one equals two. So I lead off by saying, this is an ambitious work that is a clear indication of a restless active mind. Within these pages, however, there are many assumptions and statements that are underinformed, misinformed, or simply false, thereby compromising or nullifying many of the subsequent conclusions you have drawn. That's exactly what should happen in a peer review out of respect for one another's intellect. It opens with a quote from Terence. It can never occur that the square root of a given number when added to itself is greater than the initial number squared, for that would expose a loose thread within the fabric of our understanding, a loose thread capable of unraveling the very ground rules of mathematics. So that's a bold statement. So then I, I just say, this opening thesis is false. There are plenty of examples of this that have escaped your attention. His statement is shown to be false for every number that's less than one and greater than zero. For example, the square root of 0.64. Okay, I, I can't really talk to this specifically because it's nothing that I have really studied, but what I can say, I was watching a video earlier where this woman, she was a scientist and she was debunking Terence Howard's theory, right? So she said seven times one equals seven. And that's the exact same thing as saying one plus one, of course, seven times, right? So it's just grouping something. So then I thought if that is one plus one plus one plus one seven times, that making it seven, why is one plus one then not two? So if we're out in the forest, and we put our location in a GPS, only if we put the real location can we come to our destination. So I say that to say like, maybe the instruments which we're using right now really don't make sense when it comes to what interstellar travel and a little bit thinking higher when it comes to human civilization. Is 0 0.8. 0 0.8 is bigger than 0.64 and it's a larger number than the original. And 0.64 squared equals 0 0.4096, a smaller number than the original. To the extent that the next 35 pages depends on your stated thesis, this fact undermines your claims and assumptions and conclusions. It's not about feelings here, it's about objective reality. Okay. So at the time, I, I considered Terence a, a strong acquaintance, and then we hung out a bit and had much exchange. We haven't sp spoken much since then. But go to page two, and in here, he mentions people who he declares were persecuted because their vision exceeded the myopic view of their contemporaries. And he mentions Walter Russell, Nikola Tesla, John Keeley, and many, many more. Okay. Regarding you list, your list of people who have made brave sacrifices, I note that to be a genius, is to be misunderstood, but to be misunderstood is not to be a genius. The work of Russell, Walter Russell, has eluded any experimental support, and the work of Keeley is generally not reproducible. Science is about reproducibility. I can have the most brilliant, crazy, fun idea ever, and if I perform an experiment and no one else can duplicate that experiment, it belongs in the trash heap. It's me in my own world, thinking I have landed on an objective truth when in fact I haven't. That's how science works, the reproducibility of results. As for the work of Tesla, much of it 
had very real value to physics and our understanding of electromagnetism. And that value is duly recognized by my community in the naming of a unit of electromagnetism after him. You can't get more badass than having a unit named after you. Newton has a unit named after him. For example, the metric unit of force is a Newton. Much of the rest of his work was fringe and unrealized, either for violating known laws of physics or for being simply impractical. Just because you do some good stuff doesn't mean everything you ever did is gonna be great. I will further affirm that just because an idea sounds crazy doesn't make it wrong. The system of research and publications in peer-reviewed journals has the capacity to spot crazy but true ideas. Provide yeah, so Neil deGrasse Tyson is stating that apparently Terence Howard has to prove his theories because that's how they do it in the scientific community, and I agree 100%. But the scientific community has a lot of these loopholes which they keep on using, I guess, because you can take the moon landing as an example, right? Now, there's only one country which went to the moon, apparently, and that country is the only country which can authenticate if they went to the moon. Yeah, okay, don't worry about it. Trust us, we went to the moon, don't worry about it. Science is about reproducibility. I can have the most brilliant, crazy, fun idea ever, and if I perform an experiment and no one else can duplicate that experiment, it belongs in the trash heap. It's me in my own world, thinking I have landed on an objective truth. Isn't that conflict of interest if you are the person which are doing your own audit? Doesn't that make it a little bit, I don't know, sketchy? An audit is supposed to be done by an independent party which has really no connection to you, which can come with the truth. If you are doing something nefarious, then we can find it in the procedure of the audit. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical when it comes to that specifically. And I think that the scientific community there is hypocritical that they have these rules to other people but when it's them they can just propagate whatever they propagate and just go under the scientific umbrella there are people who are sure we did not land on the moon and they looked at the photos of neil armstrong and buzz aldrin in daylight and they say we know you're supposed to see stars in daylight and i don't see any stars in this photo right. okay so therefore we didn't really go to the moon as though NASA wouldn't know to fake that if that were the case. Okay. <laughs> we think NASA are idiots? That, that, that kind of makes a lot of sense. <laughs> if you know that, well, then we, the space people, definitely knew we it too. Definitely know it too. So why so, wouldn't we just throw, throw a little dots in the back and let you see some stars? Okay, what the person doesn't know is how photography works. Okay, the terrain is so bright from the sun, right. the aperture of the camera closes down and cannot register the light the of light. dim things such as the stars in the sky. So that's right. why. That's how that plays that, out. Ah, there you go. They're supporting by compelling arguments and ultimately supported by experiments and observations. Mm. Newton's laws, Einstein's relativity, quantum physics were all revolutionary ideas that appeared in peer review settings or journals. Meanwhile, most of the work of Russell and Keeley had no such success with their ideas. So I think on Rogan, Terence said that I trashed those three researchers. Attack that I had immediate that I had talked about Walter Russo and Victor Schauberger and John Keeley as and Tesla as the people that I looked up to. So Tesla. he threw shit on on he was like, well, Tesla Tesla stuff worked, but Tesla was never really respected and out there. When I'm just simply stating the fact, I don't think of that as trashing. I think of that as being honest. I mean, I, mean, I could have softened it, but I don't think that's what people who care about you should do. People Correct. who care will be honest with you about ideas, about thoughts. The world is changing so quickly and so is everything around us. Unfortunately, we have chosen to remain handcuffed to antiquated and obsolete beliefs. Yes. We have put an enormous amount of faith, faith into the methods and practices of old that are as dead today as the men who propagated the notion that the world was flat. So I say here, regarding your world was flat reference, it's not widely appreciated that the idea of a flat earth predates the introduction and development 
of the methods and tools of science as we practice them today. Those processes date back to around 1600, coincident with the invention of the microscope and telescope. Before then, truths were whatever seemed right to the senses. Afterwards, and to this day, truth was whatever the verified data obtained by your instruments forced you to believe if your senses otherwise contradicted the data. This fact means that there's no such misunderstanding on the scale of the flat earth in the era of modern science. And in multiple places throughout the treaties, he's attaching a number to a physical idea or a physical object. That idea goes way back, by the way. If you go back to Pythagoras, famous for the Pythagorean theorem, which we all learned in eighth grade, was it, or ninth grade? Pythagoras was also a philosopher who tried to understand how things worked. He felt, among others in his group, that if you assign a number to something, the number can imbue that object with certain meaning and significance, which means then if you manipulate the numbers, that you gain insight into the objects themselves once you've assigned a number to it. There's a lot of that that- Okay, guys, that is where I'm going to end this video. I don't really think that there's anything more to add to the conversation. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson is a bit jealous of Terence Howard because he feels like Terence Howard is cutting the line and he's not really a scientist and you know, he's an actor and actors can't really comment on scientific theories. They can't really do that. I am a very open-minded person and I think there's a little bit of dogmatism happening here when it comes to Neil deGrasse Tyson. But then again, I think you can take 50% from what one person says and another 50 from another person. And then you can what mash it together and then form your own opinion, what you think about what they're saying. I think that Terence Howard is a genius. Uh, but then again, I think his theories needs to be proven. But yeah, that, they said the same thing about Tesla. They said the same thing about Newton as well. So I guess the only thing that is going to determine if Terence is correct or not is if, I don't know, if aliens come and then they <laughs> do some form of calculation and then they say, well, I think Terence is right here or if we actually in the future can figure it out or maybe what AI is calculating in the future and they, they are simulating these things and then they look at everyone's theories and then they say, whoa, hey, Terence is actually correct. But who knows? We do not know how these planets are formed. There's a lot in physics which we do not know, uh, but the conversation is very healthy to have. I am not taking any specific side I find it very interesting, very fascinating. And yes, I still think that Terence Howard is a genius. And I do think that Neil is a little bit jealous, but then again, you got what the teacher and student dynamic there. So what one is always going to be a little bit jealous of the other. And you can't really say one is right or the other one is wrong because both of them are necessary. <laughs>